ओम नम श्री यतिराजाय विवेकानंद सूरय सच्चिस्वूपाय स्वामीने तापहारिणे सो वी वेर डिस्कसिंग द थर्ड सूत्र इन द सेकंड पाद विच सेस अविद्या अस्मिता राग द्वेष अभिनिवेश क्लेशाह सो देर आर इन द फर्स्ट two verses it was mentioned what kriya yoga is tapas swadhyaya and ishvara pranidhana now this kriya yoga is meant as a preliminary discipline to remove the klesha that is verse number or sutra number 3 now these kleshas can be translated as pain bearing obstructions and as a, as we discussed last time it begins with avidya and they are the five pain bearing obstructions which prevent us from realizing our true self or our union with the purusha or our disassociation with prakruti so to effect that to have a uh, mind which is free from the kleshas we practice kriya yoga that was the uh, first the, that was the content of the first two sutras now the third sutra says avidya asmita raga dvesha abhinivesha so these are the klesha kleshas are five and the main one is avidya because from avidya arises uh, the other four so the five for five fold ties that bind us down that prevent the mind from realizing its union with the purusha ignorance is the cause and the other four are its effects so from ignorance four things branch out one is asmita that is ego that is egoism then we have raga raga means attachment dvesha means aversion likes and dislikes so what we are averse to is known as a dislike and what we attracts us is a kind of attachment and then finally there is one more which is known as abhinivesha so patanjali psychology is very simple if you see all our pain bearing obstructions or kleshas can be reduced to five of course the basic is avidya according to vedanta also avidya is the cause of ignorance is the cause of all our misery but how does it cause misery yoga goes a step ahead and classifies avidya branches make it creates four branches which makes us easier to understand it makes us easier to understand what these kleshas are why they are called pain bearing why is ego a pain bearing obstruction why is attachment a pain bearing obstruction why is aversion hatred also is a uh, sort of pain bearing obstruction that clouds our vision that clouds our uh, realization of the pure shining purusha which is also known as brahman or atman in in vedanta and clinging to life now what is this this, this abhinivesha mean so all these things will be described all the sutras that follow will describe in great detail what avidya is what what are its characteristics what are its properties what is asmita the meaning and what its characteristics are what is raga what is dvesha and what is abhinivesha all everything will be described but right now we have to remember that ignorance or hallucination makes us suffer so all the pain bearing instructions that make us suffer can be classified into five so avidya now we will start avidya क्षेत्र उत्तरेशा प्रसुप्त तनु विच्छिन्न उदाराण सो इग्नोरेन्स इज द प्रोडक्टिव फील्ड ऑफ ऑल दिस इट इज द इट इज द क्षेत्र क्षेत्र मीन्स द फील्ड वेर ऑल दीज सीड्स ग्रो एज आई टोल्ड यू संस्कार कंपेर्ड टू दीज सीड्स वेन यू प्लांट ए सीड वॉट एपन्स वेन यू वेन इट गेट्स द राइट काइंड ऑफ 
uh, manure or right kind of water and soil, the seeds sprout and then it grows into a big tree. Then it is very difficult. Then we have to, to remove that tree, we have to cut it. And cutting a tree is not so easy. But it's far easy to see that the seed does not sprout at all. That is the easiest method and the safest method. If you want to weed a certain plot of land, it is always better to burn the, weed, the seeds which, or burn the weeds, the, the seeds which give rise to these harmful weeds, it is better to burn them. So that similarly, kleshas are potential troublemakers. Avidya, Asmita, Avidya gives rise. Avidya is the field. Ignorance is the field. It is not the seed actually. Avidya is the field where these seeds survive. It is a productive field. Without Avidya, Asmita, Raga, Dvesha and Abhinesha, Abhinivesha, these four things will not survive. If Avidya goes, then everything else goes. That's why Vedanta focuses, unlike Yoga. Yoga goes in a very systematic way from step by step. It starts with Raga, Dvesha. It tells you to be detached. Even Vedanta says that. But Advaita Vedanta says, since Avidya is the main cause, if we don't have the field at all, if there is no soil or no water, then let the seeds be there, it won't harm. That is one way. But a more reasonable and a more practical way is to, we know the seeds are deeply, uh, uh, deep, uh, are deep inside the soil. So you can't root it out, you can't burn it. Uh, burn it. So the best way is, to not give it water or do not allow it to sprout. How to do it? That has been explained now. So ignorance, we have to remember, avidya gives rise to these four kleshas. Avidya itself is a klesha, but that is the field. Whether they are dormant, prasupta, attenuated, that is uh, made powerless. There are some seeds which do not sprout so easily because they are defective. So that, that has to be done. So some of our thoughts are petrified. They are dormant. They are not apparent at all. But we do not know when they will spring to life. But if they are attenuated or they are uh, sublimated, it is better. Overpowered or expanded. So ignorance is the cause of egoism, ahankara. Then it gives rise to attachment. Ahankara gives rise to attachment. When you say mine, I like this. And then it also gives rise to aversion, dvesha. We hate certain things. I don't like this. The strong likes and dislikes implies a strong ego. If the ego is there, if asmita is there, then raga and dvesha will also follow in its train. So they are all connected to each other. Avidya is the ground, the field where all these seeds of egoism, the seeds of attachment, the seeds of aversion, hatred, and the seeds of clinging to life, these impressions exist in different states. Sometimes they are dormant. As Swamiji mentions, that we sometimes say he is as innocent as a baby. Because the baby apparently is born, as many people believe, is born with a clean slate. But yoga says no. The only thing a baby is innocent because he, he, his uh, samskaras, which he has inherited from the previous birth, according to yoga and Hindu philosophy, they, they are lying dormant. That is why he looks innocent. But that same baby can become a crook or he can become a saint. Um, uh, both possibilities are there. But as of now, the uh, saint or the sinner is innocent as a baby because of the prasupta, that is the dormant or the potential seeds which are totally under the soil. They don't have a chance, there's no water and they are not growing. They're just lying there, but they are full of power. And the moment they get water, the moment the child grows, all its innocence is lost. Uh, in fact, Swamiji says, a child is born innocent, but that innocence is robbed by society. And then he uh, develops raga, he develops dvesha, 
because those seeds are already there. He cannot develop something which he did not possess in the first place. But you take some examples where a child is born without raga and dvesh. If those seeds are not there, you will find that in spite of being in the worst possible circumstance, the person turns out to be a vairagi, a saint. Shukadeva, for example, how much they tried to bind him to this world. First of all, he was not ready to be born. And once he was born also, he left the world and uh, went away. Because all the samskaras, they were uh, in that baby or the child uh, Shuka, they were, they were, they, he did not have all these kleshas were burnt. There was no chance of them uh, getting, I mean, expanding. Udara, Udara, Udarana, Udara means to expand. So these samskaras, they grow. Expand means actually it's not expansion, but it is growth. So the seeds which are overpowered may suddenly, when it gets proper water and the soil, the right kind of soil, they will expand. And not only they will expand, they'll, they'll create havoc in somebody's life. So the baby may be innocent in prasupta, but he will, the, the adult that comes out of that baby when he grows, depending on what kleshas he was born with and what was the type of surrounding he was provided. If water was, if there were a lot of seeds of evil in that, that is dvesha and hatred and maybe even attachment to evil deeds. If those things were present in a potential form, in a prasupta form, so as soon as he gets the water, the seeds sprout and they become trees very quickly. So he can be that baby maybe in the state of a demon or of a god. So he can become a very evil person or he can become a very saintly person. But that will be a slow process as the child grows. In the yogi, they say these impressions, that is the samskaras left by you, a born yogi, I mean in a yogi who becomes a yogi in this life or who is born as a yogi. That is why Gita says, whatever sadhana you do, nothing is lost. You will be born in the family of yogis. Why does Sri Krishna say that? You will be born in a family of yogis means you will be born uh, and inherit those qualities. You will be klesha mukta and you will be free from all these seeds because they, are, they do not exist. The samskaras left by the past actions are attenuated. That is, they exist in a very fine state and he can control them. Even if the seeds are there, he can control them, weed them out if necessary. There are certain weeds which have to be burnt. There is no other way because they have grown big enough. But if they are tender, if they are in the tanu avastha, so tanu karana, klesha tanu karana means to make them uh, very, very fine, ineffective. So that even if they grow, they are harmless. That is what a yogi attempts to do. He can control them and not allow them to become manifest, to become a big tree. Overpowered means that one set of impressions is held down for a while by those that are stronger. But they come out when that repressing cause is removed. For example, if you see, some weeds are not allowed to grow by putting a plastic sheet. But you remember, even if they are deprived of oxygen, somehow some oxygen, some water seeps through that sheet. And that is enough for the weeds to survive. The moment the sheet which is put on the top of the soil uh, breaks in some place or is removed, then you will see the weeds again start growing. So overpowered means vichinna. Vichinna means you are trying to overpower it. See, for example, there are seeds of evil in you or seeds of jealousy in you. And your parents or maybe the seeds of anger also in you. But somehow the fear of your parents or the teachers and others prevent you from showing that, exhibiting that anger and expressing that anger. But that doesn't mean the anger has gone away. It has been suppressed. It has been vichinna, made vichinna means suppressed, overpowered. So these samskaras, either you can, uh, either the samskaras are found in a potential form, harmless at the present, like in a baby, but ready to pounce upon you when they grow, 
when the child grows all these evil qualities will suddenly start manifesting and a person who has given all good samskaras the parents wonder we gave him such nice samskaras we provided so much of good thought for him but his evil tendencies overpowered his the goodness that was given to him unless uh, the overpowering was so much that the child somehow manages to survive and then uh, if he is in under the influence of a yogi maybe those bad samskaras can be removed but normally it is inherited from a previous life or maybe from childhood but when the repressing cause is removed the vichinna klesha or samskara samskaras are nothing but kleshas so these samskaras these kleshas <clears throat> they become vichinna they are repressed but when that repressing cause when for example parents are not there or the teacher is not there then nobody is there to discipline the child the child is free he can express that's why everybody wants freedom they don't want somebody to somebody to force them to behave in a particular way that's why they the moment they are free from school they are very happy because in school a lot of their kleshas natural kleshas are suppressed i'm not saying it's a good thing discipline is necessary vichinna avastha is necessary but yoga says tanu karana is a much better way you have to teach the child how to overcome anger rather than ask him to repress or suppress the anger repression is bad if it is done unconsciously out of fear out of fear of the teacher he may not get angry but the moment he comes out he will start quarreling with his friends or his peers he was not quarreling he was repressing all that anger and that anger was waiting to uh, manifest itself and when the repressive factors are removed when there is no parent or no uh, teacher uh, in the vicinity the child decides now it is enough is enough i'll express my anger and then he will give vent to his anger so but and the last state is the expanded when the samskaras having helpful surroundings attain to great activity either as good or evil now this is known as udara udara means now the samskaras have grown into a big tree if the seed is good the tree will be good and he will do immense good to society but if the seed is bad if it is a weed or some poisonous tree then it will cause harm but in any case they have expanded beyond control so it is very difficult you have to either cut it down or burn it down but it is always better to overpower them or best is to attenuate them mer tanu karana or make it tanu so prasupta potentially dormant tanu means attenuated or reduced the effectivity of which is reduced vichinna that means overpowered by some stronger emotion or some repressing factor and udara allowed to expand so there are certain samskaras which should be allowed to expand for example unselfishness when a child uh, decides to gift small things the parent should not stop him he is expressing his natural tendency to share things with others and if you restrict them if you repress them then that quality will not develop so there are certain things which should be allowed to expand and there are certain things which we if you observe if we allow them to expand later on it may be too difficult to control that child so that is the idea of avidya how avidya which is the field where all the seeds grow kshetra uttaresham the prasupta tanu in different states these kleshas are there like seeds four different categories of seeds one is raga the seeds of attachment one is dvesha the seeds of hatred hatred towards objects hatred towards people hatred towards certain things that is dvesha liking or attachment towards good things or even attachment towards the bad things it's not necessary that everybody is attached to good things only a person may be attached to something which is very trivial and that may cause great harm so raga is equally harmful as dvesha so hatred people justify their hatred they say i don't like this i don't like that yeah, they may make a big list of what they like and what they don't like sometimes 
what they don't like is more i don't like this i don't like this and they make a big list of things which they don't like so they they are very fastidious or they were fussy about these things oh i don't like this and the parents encourage these children and think that it's a very great achievement that my child does not like this and they don't understand that even dvesha is bad it is as bad as attachment if the child wants a chocolate and is desperate after chocolates it is no doubt bad certain things in excess they are bad but if he hates certain things and says that no i can't tolerate this i can't eat this i can't eat that i can't tolerate this person i can't tolerate that person so the, he feels that he has more things that he hates in life than he likes so that also can create a but if he really hates transient things for example he hates the temporary things but he has to love certain good things he has to love the eternal he has to love god then that kind of hatred is in a way a boon that is known as vairagya vairagya is not dvesha when you have vairagya you don't hate the people or you don't hate anybody you just say that this is not my cup of tea i can't mix with these people but you at the same time you don't hate them you don't you don't get attached to them because you know it is temporary and parting with those things will make you suffer may make you uh, will cause pain so you are afraid of raga or some kind of attachment to certain things though they may be they may appear to be good but you know this attachment will later on cause problems you are attached to certain sweets you know you have to eat it in, in within a limit but if you if your attachment if your attachment overpowers your will then you go on eating and then it can be harmful so also hatred if if it goes beyond a certain point then you will end up become a very negative person and you will start hating everything around you and that also causes problem so and udara for example uh certain liberal qualities have to be allowed to expand they should be expanded that's why swami ji says when the heart expands the mouth speaks good things that means when the heart is allowed to expand not if you are selfish if the asmita is more the ego is more then the heart contracts but the ego becomes less and less and less it is becomes tanu kar tanu in the tanu avastha where the ego is just a semblance of ego is there you see that person is a very very large hearted person he has absolutely no ego he can mix with anybody everybody uh, but at the same time he is reserved but at the same time he doesn't hate anybody so all these good qualities they come out of absence of egoism so egoism is at the root of raga dvesha and abhinivesha is clinging to life now now we come to what is avidya anitya ashuchi shuchi means pure ashuchi means impure anitya ashuchi hi dukha dukhanu atmasu nitya shuchi hi sukatmak khyatir avidya ignorance what is avidya the whole description is given anitya ashuchi that which is ignorance is nothing but taking or ex- considering the non eternal there are four or five things which are transient which are harmful and we consider them to be eternal and that is known as avidya now what are these things first is anitya the non eternal non eternal means the transient things the gross things even the subtle things which do not last long subtle things last a little longer than the gross things but still they are temporary so one has to know what non eternal is anitya is ashuchi that which is impure shuchi means pure ashuchi ashuchi means that which is impure the non eternal the impure impure means as i told you the golden rule is the grosser you go the more impurities 
when you say pure when you burn the dross when you melt gold the finer the gold becomes the purer it becomes the finer it becomes and the, uh, the purity increases so whatever is fine is pure whatever is gross is impure so anitya ashuchi the painful so that is the third one and the non self and the non self means anatma anatma su dukha anatma the painful and the anatma that which is not atman if we consider all these four categories to be eternal mistake that that mistaking the non eternal the impure the painful and the non self anatma for the eternal and thinking that it is suchi happy that is sukha people consider dukha to be sukha it's it's a very uh, strange thing paradox so avidya has been defined so beautifully by patanjali and the atman or self respectively so ignorance is taking the non eternal the impure and painful and the non self and mistaking it for eternal the pure the happy and the atman or self respectively thinking the non self to be the self so now what does it mean all the different sorts of imp uh, impressions that we have in our mind i mean the wrong impressions have only one source that is ignorance so from avidya comes asmita ego dukkha uh, uh, raga dvesha and abhinivesha we have first to learn what this ignorance is the first ignorance is all of us think i am the body when i say i am i the body no i am the self and not the self the pure the effulgent and ever blissful we have been hypnotized somebody said is it not hypnotism you are trying to tell us we who think we are the body so some western uh uh of people from the west when swami ji was speaking about the pure eternal self which is one's uh, nature they said are you trying to hypnotize us we can see that we are wicked we are weak we are big or we are small all these characteristics we associate with our ego and you are telling that you are the pure the effulgent and they were be, are you asking us to hypnotize are you trying to hypnotize us and trying to say that we are the pure self the atman the deathless the birthless such wonderful characteristics you are trying to superimpose upon us and you are trying to uh, brainwash us or maybe trying to hypnotize us so swami ji says in fact i am trying to dehypnotize you not hypnotize you i i am not a person hypnotist who's trying to hypnotize you into something which you are not i'm just pointing out to you that you have been hypnotized that you are weak i'm the body i'm not the self i'm the impure i am the non eternal the painful and all these things you are crying the whole world is bad and everything around you is bad there is lot of injustice there is lot of pain so all these things swami ji says is because you have hypnotized yourself you were the innocent self the innocent child perhaps when he was born without the influence of the samskaras he was a pure being full of bliss full of effulgent pure but slowly that purity was taken away that effulgence that bright brightness which you see associate in a small child's eyes looking at wonderment uh all around him all this innocence that spark of innocence is taken away as the child grows and that bliss becomes painful so all that is painful all that is impure all that is non eternal is superimposed and we brainwash ourselves that we are all these things we are limited beings we are hopeless beings we are weak beings we are dominated by others we are black we are you know, we belong to this religion that religion ethnicity all this brainwashing swami ji says is nothing but you have hypnotized yourself why don't you consider the other side other argument you say i am hypnotizing you to tell you that you are pure you are birthless you are deathless you are the eternal atman in fact i am dehypnotizing you because 
nobody uh, you, the whole world has hypnotized you everybody right from childhood you were born blissful you were born pure and slowly they hypnotized you and made you into what you are today a bundle of emotions a bundle of confusion a bundle of ignorance a bundle of raga dvesha and abhinivesha all these things where addict to you does a child fear any death he is fearless he is pure because he is pure he is blissful he doesn't have any worry in the world and we superimpose everything and hypnotize that child and put fear into his brain put impurity into his personality and tell uh, ask him to do impure things as he grows and then finally say that he has Uh, he has depression. He has this. He has anxiety. He has worry. Naturally, we have hypnotized him. Now he will be in that hypnotic state. So Swami Ji says, "I come to dehypnotize you. I have come to dehypnotize you, and that is possible only if you remove avidya. So ignorance or avidya, that is avidya. Dehypnotization is avidya. We think of man and see him as the man as as a body. Now Swami Ji says that is the biggest delusion." that is why that abhinivesha comes when a worm swami ji gave that example when a worm is about to be crushed it tries to prevent it is present in every living being that desire to preserve the body to preserve the temporary no doubt that is a, a, a expression of the desire to live eternally that shows but that is not the solution preserving one's body making it live up to 100 years is a very good thing people follow naturopathy and then yoga and all those asanas they try to become young they try to remove all the diseases and extend at the most they'll succeed to extend their body even though there are wrinkles they'll use all sorts of makeup and try to show the world that they are young but how long at the most 100 years so what is 100 years compared to eternity so the delusion that we are the body and swami ji says it went to extreme the eternality of the spirit was superimposed on the body and the egyptian pharaohs they would not even bury their body they would not burn their body they would embalm it keep it in pyramids keep all the costly things positions though they know they are of no use to that person all the foods that he loved the clothes that he loved the gold that he earned everything all the treasures were kept near the dead body of the pharaoh whom they embalmed using honey and all sorts of techniques it is of no use to the body but their idea that the self is the body was so so deeply rooted the great delusion that one is a body and one survives even after death somehow these positions will he will need that position he these positions were his so a lot of wealth when they broke and then to cover that to see that it is not stolen by other people they built this huge pyramids because they had the money they were rich people these pharaohs were the big rulers so those who can afford they built all these tombs which are known as pyramids these pyramids are nothing but structures where they tried to create a delusion in their minds there was a delusion that all these non eternal things temporary things gold and all those things the possessions of that king they would they they will be useful to these people and these things should be there even after his death and they considered this uh, self as the body and swami ji says that is the biggest delusion so abhinivesha is a delusion this clinging to that that hope that i will survive that i will not die i will retain this physical body you can retain it you can take good care of it no doubt and live up to 100 years but the purpose of living for 100 years is not to uh, uh, not to live with the hope that the body will last eternally that it would be foolishness the idea that you should have a body for 100 years is that you get more time to realize that you are the spirit that is the only purpose of a long life that is why they say uh, 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 all these sadhakas they should aspire to live long if they 
consider the fact that before they leave this gross body, they have to realize that they are the spirit. That's the only uh, justification for a long, healthy life. Otherwise, a long, healthy life, uh, just for the sake of enjoying the material benefits or the material treasures which one has accumulated, is, is not justified. Because ultimately, all these things will go away. Even after your death, all the wealth that you have earned, even if it is put in the grave beside you, or you are entombed like these pharaohs, you are not going to use it. So that, Swamiji says, is the great delusion. So, anitya, ashuchi, dukkha, anatma, these things, that is the non-eternal, the impure, the painful and the non-self, we confuse and think that, that that is the eternal, the pure, the happy. Dukkha, we take it as sukha. We don't know this, everything is leading us to dukkha. Buddha realized that. That's why he says Dukkha Nivarana, to remove this Dukkha and have eternal Sukha. Uh, Atyantika Dukkha Nivrutti. This is a Vedantic dictum followed by Buddha later on. Atyantika Dukkha Nivrutti. Dukkha means all types of pain, all types of sorrows to remove. The goal of Vedanta should be by realizing the Self Atyantika Dukkha Nivrutti to remove all sorts of sorrows. And Parama Sukha Prapti. Parama Sukha means not just temporary Sukha, but Parama Sukha, permanent bliss, ever blissful. So if you want Parama Sukha Prapti, you have to remove the Dukkha. And the way is through yoga by considering discriminating between real and unreal, between pure and impure the painful and the painless or the happy and the non-self and the self. So this distinction, if we keep our minds uh, discriminative enough and don't allow avidya to cloud it, then you reach the goal. Don't allow the soul to be deluded. That is the idea. So that is verse number five. And uh, then we come to verse number six or the uh, uh, we come to the sutra number 6 the sixth sutra says what is ego now we describe what avidya is avidya we saw is taking the non eternal the impure the painful and the non self and mistaking it for the eternal the pure the happy and the self respectively so after that this avidya gives rise to four kleshas we saw it now the first klesha is ego now, what is this ego? Uh, we have to now uh, understand what this ego is. This ego, now before that, before we consider what this ego is, let us see uh, in the light of um, the uh, Vedanta or uh, maybe some kind of comparative uh, Christian theology, what it means the, the previous sutra because this avidya is a very important concept and if we understand it especially for those who uh, follow different ideologies this path of yoga is very clear what is avidya now uh, this this avidya it creates obstacles that was made clear in uh, verse number 4 we saw in the sutra number 4 I just want to recapitulate that before we start what egoism is let us see what ignorance why ignorance create other obstacles as we saw in verse 4 before going to the sixth verse i just go back one verse to verse number 4 or uh, or to uh, sutra number 4 where avidya kshetram uttaresham it is the field why it is the field why avidya is the field for all these things, for all the other four kleshas. Ignorance creates all the other obstacles, all the other kleshas. They may exist in a potential or a, a some kind of rudimentary form or they may not have been temporarily overcome, tanukarana, or fully developed, udara. Now, what, what is the relationship between Kriya Yoga, which we described in the first two verses? Austerity, tapasya. 
study and dedication of fruits such study means swadhyaya and dedication of fruits of one's work to god we saw in the uh, aphorism 1 and 2 they are preliminary steps the karma yoga that we have to do the preparation that we have to do towards the power of concentration which we uh, which which is the result of the removal of the kleshas these seeds and then only perfect state of yoga is possible chitta vritti nivrutti chitta vritti nivrutti or uh, remove the chitta vritti nirodha is possible only if the kleshas are destroyed but before that we have to find out what what is the purpose of this kriya yoga it is it has a positive value but there is a negative value also to this kriya yoga means it they are the means of removing obstacles to concentration so it is it is negative in the sense uh, it is like removing another thorn by one more thorn the thorn is a dangerous thing but sometimes it can be useful so in a negative sense also kriya yoga removes the obstacles to concentration these obstacles are there they are thorns so use another thorn to remove that thorn and then throw away both i don't keep the first one that is what it is meant the word obstacle here has has to be considered why patanjali says there are obstacles these kleshas are kleshas not good is not raga good that is a very common question asked by everybody i am attached what what if i am attached i am attached to good food i am attached to this thing many people say why 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 a religion asks us not to get attached it's one of the most unpleasant things for worldly people they are attached to so many things how can you just tell me to be detached to my mercedes benz to all the wonderful things that i have painfully accumulated what is wrong if i am attached so why is why are they raga and obstacle now this has to be very clearly understood before we go to avidya uh, let us go back now first to the sutra 4 which says kleshas are obstacles now if we accept that without reasoning then it will not help us just because our scriptures say raga is an obstacle so don't be attached now there will be people who want to enjoy the world like uh, uh, the person who went to swami ji uh, robert ingersoll in usa he was an atheist he did not believe in any religion or any religious ideas he was an atheist confirmed atheist and he said i don't agree with all that you say he was a very honest man and he became a great admirer and friend of swami ji also so he came and told him uh, i don't accept what you say because i believe that i believe that the world is like an orange and i want to squeeze this orange and eat and Uh, taste the orange i don't care i don't want to philosophize or uh, bring in religion to explain all these things i see the wonderful things i just enjoy as long as i live and when i die it is fine I, it doesn't matter to me i just live a life where i believe in squeezing the orange then swami ji said if you squeeze it the right way the through the vedantic way or the yogic way then you will swami ji said you will enjoy every drop of it so why considering raga dvesha and abhinivesha and avidya are obstacles kleshas are obstacles patanjali told us that but if we have to satisfy our reason we have to argue or we have to inquire why these are being called as obstacles because uh if you compare the hindu and christian thought on this subject where austerities are performed christianity also accept that you should not be attached you should deprive yourself of certain things you should perform penances christianity is based on that the whole of christianity i mean the the christianity which uh, resulted in uh, monasticism and other things they they thrived or they 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 grew because of the ascetic spirit which was highly appreciated and they thought that you can't get the grace of god and in a way they are true but there is a basic difference which we need to understand when you say an obstacle 
Why is Raga an obstacle? Why is Dvesha an obstacle? Hindu has uh, the Hindu theory or the yogic theory is slightly different from the Christian perspective. So we have to understand when a Christian speaks of a sin, he means that it is a positive act of disobedience. He, he generally means when he says sin, uh, when you say that we are sinners and we have been condemned and then we have to get rid of sin and all those things, we should he, he generally, uh, a, a Christian theologist or a other Semitic religions also, they say it is a positive type of act which we do in disobedience or ingratitude towards God. God has given all these things and if we rob it or if we take it away by force, if we do all the break the commandments as Moses said, you are committing sin. So they give a set of dogmas and set of rules. Oh, do not commit evil. Do not commit adultery. There are these ten commandments. The commandments in the uh, uh, given by Judge uh, Moses, and the commandments are almost similar in all the different religions. They are in different forms, but they they exist. And then these are considered to be sins. Why? Because you believe in a God. The Almighty will be upset and on the day of the judgment you will be punished. That is, in a way it works for the Semitic religions. That is how they uh, enforce discipline and enforce the idea of morals or ethics on society. They said you should do this. If you don't do it, it will be disobedience to God. It will be ingratitude towards God who has given you all these things. And by God, by the word God, he doesn't mean the all-pervasive Brahman. He means God the Father, the reality as it appears within time and space. He thinks he is just an extension of his own parents. He is the supreme parent or the supreme father. They would not even call him a mother because father no doubt is responsible for the child's birth, but mother is equally responsible or more responsible. She has to give birth. Anyway, even if they consider God as mother or father, it is the idea of fatherhood they have superimposed on the reality. They just want to call God the Father in heaven. That's fine as long as uh, uh, Hinduism or Vedanta is concerned. Even Hindus believe in incarnations who can be considered as father, as mother and all those things. So Hindus call him by a different name when reality appears in the bound by time and space. When you see it in the transient world, we have to imagine this God. You can't say that he, God is impersonal, God is uh, nir, nirakara, without form, is the uh, essence of consciousness. These are very good things, but we, the ordinary human intellect cannot grasp it. So Hindus also have their own idea of God, may not be as a father, but they call it Ishwara, the parent. That Ishwara can be in the form of, he need not be just male. The only difference is we accept Devis also. We accept mother as the Ishwara. We can accept father as Ishwara. We can accept any, any creation. We have an elephant god. We have so many types of deities. Everybody, any object or any animal or any human being, everything can be accepted as a representative of God. We, As long as we know that uh, it is the Ishwara whom we are worshipping, we are fine. Now, when Patanjali speaks of an obstacle, he refers rather to a negative effort which follows such an act. Like, for example, the whirling of the, suppose the light is there and you have a cloud, a cloud of dust, somebody uh, just disturbs the dust which is around that lamp. The lamp is brightly shining, but in the dust, it obscures the dust cloud of ignorance, it is something like that. I can't give you a better example. But avidya in yoga is basically different. It is not some kind of sin. Raga and Dvesha and Abhinivesha and all, because there is no question of Ishwara in Patanjali. He doesn't say that you are sinning, don't do this. If you have attachment, you will, these things will happen. If you are greedy, you should not be greedy. You should not tell lies. You should not kill. All those things are not given as commandments. They say avidya is like a cloud. The example 
that we best example we can give is suppose there is a lamp burning brightly and you enjoy seeing that lamp but suddenly somebody comes and there's lot of dust around it the cloud of dust obscures the light of atman that is what has happened the light of atman is shining beautifully within us and somehow we have raised the dust of confusion the dust of avidya and that obscures the light which we cannot see that's why we see darkness or even if we see the light we see it through the cloud of ignorance that is to say christian thought says that it is an offense against god in our case it is an offense against ishwara we of course our puranic religion also believed in that they said that ishwara will get angry or god will get angry um, there are so many uh, incarnation and deities and to please them we have to do certain penances that idea is still there it definitely it is there in all religions the idea of a god who punishes if you don't obey his commandments but yoga doesn't believe in this yoga is a slightly rational approach he says we have the christian thought emphasizes that it is an offense against god in those messages offense against ishwara if we follow the christian theology or the christian and the semitic theology who is that god is other than ourselves naturally we uh, those jesus said i and my father are one people did not understand people thought it is he is referring to only jesus what he meant was i and my father are one means one who has realized the spirit is one with that universal spirit so he was talking of advaita but in any case uh, most of the people would like to think of the father in heaven as somebody different even at the level of atman that there is unity the brahman atman and brahman are same that idea of vedanta is not palatable to many people the hindus insist that we are not committing any sin we are committing offense against our own true nature which is the atman we don't commit offense against a god who is outside of us we don't need to think that if i i am greedy if i have raga dvesha it will harm myself because the light will be obscured this fundamental difference you have to understand it is not a fundamental it is not a very uh, i mean obvious difference people belonging to different religions they can't reconcile this fact why hindus are not afraid or why do hindus are not god fearing the word god fearing is not there in hinduism whereas here you have to fear because every time you think that you are offending god as if he is a master he is there with a stick to give you uh, some kind of judgment and decide whether you will go to hell or heaven so that that concept is there in hinduism in all other religions at a at a slightly lower level because that fear prevents a lot large number of people who cannot understand the concept of the all pervading reality or ishwara they will think yes yes there is a god who sits above the clouds and who is watching all our actions as if he has no other business and he will punish us for our wrong doings and that is why we have to be good that is why we have to fear god but god fearing never took uh, roots in yoga he said it's not for the sake of fearing anybody that you have to do if you want to get rid of the if you want peace of mind if you want to realize your own self if you want happiness if you want to have remove all the kleshas and the dukha as buddha said you don't have to believe in god you have to just clear this dust then the lamp will shine in its own glory so the value of christian approach is it's definitely in a way it is good for a majority of the people because it heightens our sense and significance and our responsibility by relating it to a being whom we have every reason to love obey our creator our father so that brings a kind of intimacy there there are certain good things in that approach also because otherwise people will do as they like they are much better if they fear god or and do it provided they love that father in heaven one need not fear one need not be god fearing but if one is god loving if one loves god that is what sri ram krishna says god is our own 
we don't have to fear him we don't have to do actions out of fear as if he is a uh, judge waiting to judge us but because we love him we will not do things which go against his will our the reason why hindus or and even some christians christians who understand and all the other religions if they love god they uh, they don't fear god they don't bother that the, the consequences that will go to eternal hell and all those things they don't they are not afraid of that and their job is only to love god because he is the dearest in that respect the the hindu approach and the christian approach is same the value of the hindu approach which is basically based on love rather than fear is that it presents the consequences of sin in their ultimate aspect what does this avidya do to us what is this ignorance ego why is ego bad it's not simply disobeying the creator it is bad because it we cause harm to ourselves it is alienating us from the reality the lamp is getting covered you are not able to see the light so for that simple reason we have to uh, follow all this ethical principle that is the utility of kriya yoga so in our next class we will take this up if there are some questions i'll just go through we are already we started late so i just uh, uh, have this 10 minutes extra so if there is any question i'll i don't think there is any question okay there are some few thank yous for a clarity of understanding and all those things uh okay one question is there i'll just try to answer this very briefly doing something out of fear is it different from doing something out of love obviously it is very very obvious why god alone in in your home if you do something out of fear if you fear your parents and do certain things and you do the same thing out of love is there uh, can you not see the difference between the two one is a very negative way one is a very negative way because that fear as long as that fear is there he will obey his parents but if he loves his parents if he loves knowing fully well that if i don't do this or if i do this the parents will be happy and because he doesn't want to hurt them he does it out of love not because the parents will punish him if he does it out of fear if the parents are not there when a day we might come when these props will be removed when the support will not be there uh, then he will not obey because that fear has gone they are physically not present to harm you but if you really love that person even after the passing away of that person you will that memory itself will tell you that i have to do all these things because the person whom i loved liked me liked me for this reason and these are the things he loved me and i have to do it for their sake even if they may not be there so that is a huge difference uh, between doing something out of fear and that is why we hindus are not supposed to use the word god fearing it has been borrowed from the west or the other semitic religions that oh he is a god fearing person uh, the hindu will not appreciate this he said why should you fear at least shriram krishna's religion doesn't expect us to fear god of course there are many sects which fear god and which teach you to fear god which puts lot put but that is all creation of the priests our scriptures never said that but the priests uh because they knew they can thrive on the fear of the people so they'll put a lot of fear oh because you did not do this you are suffering do this pay me some money i will find the solution so this priest craft led to this idea of fear in all religions including hinduism in hinduism also it is there there are people who fear shani ni the shani uh, then there are so many in 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 Uh, the semitic religions at least there is only one father in heaven whom they have to be afraid but poor hindus are in deeper trouble because 
they fear many smaller gods as well if they don't fear uh, uh, hanuman ji or somebody else they'll say oh shani is there uh, now shani means some kind of planet they fear all the planets they fear all the different uh, things that are there there are 33 so many crores of gods there's so many they say there are so many gods in hindu religion so if we start fearing them then there will be fear all around if you don't fear ganesha then you'll fear hanuman if you don't fear hanuman then there will be oh maybe i displeased uh, ganesha i should have given some kind of then people go to these different temples and travel all over uh, india we have seen many people oh perhaps we did not do this so we have to satisfy even the snakes they will go and feed milk to the snakes saying that uh, nag dasha and this dasha and that dasha then they will blame the planets they will blame the stars swami ji hated this kind of attitude in one very strong lecture he says if the stars and planets and all the twinkling stars so far off in space in the sky sitting there if they twinkle a little more if these twinkling stars and their pl- planetary positions determine your fate then it is better to die what is the use of such a life why are you fooled by these twinkling stars so that is the approach swami vivekananda had so doing out of fear doing out of fear either of custom or maybe superstition or any kind of faith fear is always something which swami ji said we should avoid strength is the uh, reason a strength is the only thing that makes you truly religious okay so i take your leave Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Sri Ram Krishna Arpanamastu